Welcome uh, tonight to Christmas Hope, uh, lesson number one. Before we get going with this study, if we could just come before the Lord in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, it's December. And uh, we just uh, pray, Lord, for this upcoming month that you would speak to us in a bold way, that you would encourage your people as only you can. And Lord, we just pray that we will not miss the true reason for this season, your son Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, one night uh, long ago, some shepherds received an extraordinary message uh, from some angels, angels who were sent by God. And as I, I read those words again and again, I couldn't help but think how applicable they are to our world situation uh, today. And uh, yeah, in a temporal, uh, physical uh, sense, they are applicable, but more so in a spiritual sense. And so in this uh, four-week study, we're going to be looking at four phrases or words spoken by an angel or angels to some shepherds who were tending their flocks one night outside of a little town called Bethlehem. And, and here are the words. We're really going to be focusing on the next four weeks from Luke chapter 2, verses 10 to 14. But the angel said to them, to the shepherds, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths or swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And so the four words or phrases that we're going to focus in on the next four weeks, number one, do not be afraid. Number two, good news. Number three, joy. And finally, number four, peace. Uh, there is uh, some study sheets. There are study sheets that are available. Um, and I just encourage you, if you'd like, uh, to print these out. And it's just an outline of what I'm going to be sharing uh, each uh, week. And there is some room uh, for you to uh, fill in some notes if you would like. And I also encourage you to have your Bible open. And uh, hopefully I'll go slow enough so that you can actually look up those Bible passages. But uh, tonight we're going to be focusing on those words, do not be afraid. I find it amazing how many times those words appear in the Christmas story. Uh, do not be afraid. So let's just take a look at some of the instances. First of all, I encourage you to turn in your Bibles uh, to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 13. Uh, Luke um, chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, so much about uh, the birth of Jesus Christ and uh, what led up to that birth as well. So Luke chapter 1, verse 13, it says, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him the name John. Uh, so who's the angel speaking to? Well, we find out the angel is speaking uh, to Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest, and one day uh, he was chosen, the Bible says, to go into the temple in order to burn incense. And we're told that at this time, the burning of the incense, that the people, they were outside, and the Bible says they were outside praying. So I'm imagining that Zechariah, uh, he's all alone, and his job, his duty is to burn incense. And suddenly, the Bible says an angel appears on the right side of the altar of incense. So, question is, how do you think Zechariah is going to respond when suddenly uh, there was this angel who appears out of nowhere? Well, in verse 12, it says, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. Now, 
wouldn't you expect that reaction? Angel appears out of nowhere. You're all by yourself. Uh, so it says that he was startled, uh, gripped with fear. But I really believe that the words of the angel, do not be afraid, um, directed to two different situations. For, first of all, there was the uh, immediate. So don't be afraid, Zechariah. In other words, I'm not here to harm you, but I am here as a messenger with news that will change your life. You see, there was the immediate, but the reality is, I, I believe there was also another fear. It wasn't just the angel suddenly appearing. There was another fear that gripped Zechariah on a daily basis. And it was the fear of having no children, of being childless. And so when the angel says, do not be afraid, did you notice what else the angel adds? Your prayer has been heard. Your, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And, and so it's possible that after all of these years, Zechariah was afraid that his prayers were not heard. And, and so the angel says, okay, I appeared suddenly, don't be afraid. But also, Zechariah, don't be afraid. God heard your prayers. And God answered. So that's the first instance. Go to Luke now, chapter 1, verse 30. Go down a few verses. And uh, verse 30 says, But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Same deal here. This time it's Mary. But this time we're, all, we're given the, the name of the angel. The angel was named uh, Gabriel. And if you go back up to verse 28, Gabriel says, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And then go to verse 29. It says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. It seems to me, this is remarkable, that Mary wasn't necessarily troubled with the appearance of the angel but more troubled with the angel's greeting. And, and so it's then that Gabriel says, okay, Mary, don't be afraid. And I, again, it's very possible that, that Gabriel was addressing the immediate. You know, an angel suddenly appears. Uh, Mary, you, you don't need uh, to be afraid. She was a remarkable young lady, but she was also human, okay? So it's very possible that she was afraid. But I also believe in some respects, that, that God sent this angel Gabriel to, to um, address the future because Mary was a virgin and suddenly she would be with child. And, and that was scandalous, I, especially in that day and age. She could have been put to death by stoning if she was found to be with child and uh, she wasn't married. So I wonder if Mary as she navigated through these treacherous nine months. I, I wonder if she hung on to those words, Mary, you have found favor with God. Do not be afraid. That's the second instance. Third instance, go to Luke chapter 2, verse 10. It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Now this time, it's not Zechariah, it's not Mary. This time it's them, it's the shepherds. And shepherds were the lowest of the low. I mean, nobody paid any attention to shepherds, except for God. Now, let me uh, set the scene. We find out that it is nighttime. That means that it's dark. Now, these shepherds were used to thieves or wild animals uh, suddenly uh, appearing during the night watch. But an angel? Well, well, an angel appeared to Zechariah. An angel appeared to Mary. But with the shepherds, listen to this, an angel appears and then it says, the glory of the Lord shone around them. It seems to me that the shepherds not only got an angel like Zechariah, but they got a light show as well. And the Bible says they were terrified. 
well, yeah, anybody and everybody would have reacted in the same way. So the angel says to them, once again, those words, do not be afraid. And again, the angel is addressing the immediate concern, the terror produced by this uh, sudden uh, appearance. But I also believe the angel alleviates the fear with a promise that he didn't show up to cause harm, but he showed up with some great news. One more instance in the Gospel of Luke. Now I want you to go back to Luke chapter 1. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 74. It says, To rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear. Back to Zechariah. Zechariah, uh, his son is born, calls him John. And, and this is part of Zechariah's song. Really, it's a, a song of praise. Zechariah, in this song of praise, he speaks of the promises that the prophets made of old. And he speaks of the promise that was given to Abraham. It was the promise of one who would rescue, the one who would deliver. And whether or not Zechariah fully understood who he was singing about, he was actually singing about Jesus. And then if you go down to verse 76 of this song, he, he first sings about Jesus, and then from 76 to the end of his song, he sings about his son, the forerunner of the Messiah. Well, just hang on to those words, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies. Today, our greatest enemies are sin, death, and the power of the devil. Jesus came to rescue us from our greatest enemies. I want you to listen to uh, these words from Martin Luther. This is his explanation to the second article of the Apostles' Creed, the part of the Apostles' Creed that speaks about Jesus Christ. Here's just a portion of his explanation. He says of Jesus that he purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Okay, got that? So when Zechariah sings, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, and then he says, to enable us to serve him without fear. God had in mind a, a, a life where we would live under him, in his kingdom, serving him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. You see, the blessed life is serving the Lord God Almighty without fear. You know who he is. You know who you are. He's the rescuer. You are the rescued. And he's done it. I need not be afraid. But I am. And, 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 and we are. So what if we looked at uh, some of the immediate fears that, that we might have? And um, first of all, though, let, let's take a look at the three different types of fear. Um, because there are three different types. So uh, in 2020, we need to hear the message of the angel, do not be afraid. Well, there are some healthy fears, aren't there? Uh, there? There are some things that we should be afraid of, and it's good to be afraid of them. With, with your kids, right, you want to instill in them a fear of the oven, of, of touching those burners. Even if the stove is not on, you don't want them to go near it, to touch it. In some respects, with COVID-19, we, we ought to have a healthy fear uh, of the, the virus, and it should lead us to, to have certain precautions like wearing a mask, uh, socially distancing from people. That's okay. It's okay to have those healthy fears. And, and then there's also righteous fear. The Bible speaks about that. And, and this is the, the, the fear spoken of the Bible several times. For example, 
If you go to Psalm 111, verse 10, especially in the Old Testament, it speaks of this righteous fear. But Psalm 11, 111, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Now, the righteous fear spoken of in the Bible is not a fear where we run away from him or we hide from him. Now, a word that you can substitute for that word fear, this righteous fear, is the word awe, or, or maybe the, the word reverence. So the awe of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord, is the beginning of understanding. This is the understanding, again, that he is God, and I'm not. I just stand in awe of that. I stand in awe of him. He deserves all the honor, glory, and praise. You know, the, the, the wise of this world, they stand in awe of the fact that we as human beings, we put a person on the moon. Well, those who follow the Lord God Almighty, they have true wisdom, and they stand in awe of the fact that God made the moon. <laughs> he created it out of nothing. Folks, in a, a spiritual sense, the wise of this world, world, they look at one man's death upon a cross some 2,000 years ago, and they look at it as absolute foolishness. That's not how you save the world, by dying on a cross. But those who are wise in the Lord, they stand in awe, a reverence of a God, and what he accomplished at a place called Calvary. He has forgiven us all of our sins. So you've got healthy fear, you've got righteous fear, and then finally there is uh, destructive fear. And, and quite simply, uh, there are fears that I really believe the Lord doesn't want us to have. And so often uh, these fears become destructive. So often these fears lead to some uh, bad habits, like relying upon substances. To, to alleviate the, the fear or, or, or the worry. Th these uh, fears can also um, affect relationships that we have with those uh, around us. And, and so often, these fears can lead to loneliness and sometimes great resentment. They can lead to isolation. And, and, and never minimize, never minimize the, the, those traumatic events in, in, in our early lives and how they have, you know, etched pathways of fear in our minds and in our hearts. So then the question, uh, what is your phobia? What is your fear? Where in your life does God need to meet you the most? With these words, do not be afraid. What is it? Maybe it's the fear of the unknown. Uh, so often, uh, I find with the unknown, at least in my mind, that uh, fear and worry do a dance in my mind. Uh, both of them are there. And, and, and it, it, if you haven't you know, been there before, um, there will come a time where you're, you're, you're standing on the verge of tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. And, and, and there are these fears. So, so what about, um, you know, the doctor calls you up and says, uh, I just want you to come in. We need to talk. You don't even know what it's about. And, and yet there is this fear of what tomorrow will bring and, and, and what kind of bad news the doctor will share. You don't even know what it's about. There's a, a story um, of um, a Persian general he captured a spy one day, and he, uh, he sentenced uh, this spy uh, to death uh, because of what he had done. And this general had a strange custom, so anyone who he caught and uh, was condemned to death, he would give them an option. He said, you, you can either die of, by firing squad, or secondly, uh, you can opt for that big black door. So... Uh, the, the moment of execution drew, drew near, and the guards, they, they brought the, the spy uh, to the general. And so the general asked, so um, I've shared with you what it's going to be. 
Is it going to be the firing squad or is it going to be the big black door? And the spy hesitated uh, for a little while and finally uh, the spy chose the firing squad. And uh, the, the shots rang out and the general uh, knew that uh, the spy had been killed and, and the general turned to his aide and this is what he said. They always prefer the known to the unknown. People fear what they don't know. Yet we gave him a choice. And so the aide then asked, he said, well, okay, general, what, what's behind the big black door? And the general responded, freedom. We're afraid of the unknown because it's unknown. How about, uh, do you have fears concerning the necessities of life? <laughs> Obviously in these, um, Last uh, few months, uh, people are afraid they're going to run out of toilet paper. They're afraid they're going to uh, run out of uh, cleansing products for their, their home. And there is this fear concerning uh, the necessities of, of life. And let me just share with you what Jesus says about this. And this is in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 uh, to 27. It's a real section on worry, but maybe it addresses our fear when it comes to the necessities of life. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? So we may be afraid of the unknown. We may be afraid that we're not going to have stuff, that we're somehow going to run out. Some people are afraid of natural disasters. And, but the truth is, we live in a great part of the country, don't we? We, got, we might have 25 inches of snow, but we don't have the earthquakes, the hurricanes, uh, the tornadoes experienced in other parts of this land. But still, we think about it, right? Uh, what if we travel to one of those parts of the country? Years ago, I went to California. And I remember uh, sitting in my hotel room thinking about earthquakes. And if one strikes, which way am I going to run? And uh, we're afraid of travel. What if you have a loved one who lives in one of those parts of the country? We might be afraid uh, for them. And then the last one, we may be afraid of physical harm or death. And it may be, uh, may be personal. It may be a fear for a loved one. Uh, that they're going to be harmed, that something bad is going to happen to them. And I, I really believe King David, uh, he could relate to this one because in Psalm 55, David pours out his heart uh, to the Lord. And beginning in verse 2, this is what he says. He says, My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught at the voice of my enemy, at the stares of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revile me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. By the way, for, for me to say, hey, I'm afraid, is a very natural, I believe, human reaction. King David, listen, he says, fear and trembling have beset me. So, so we are afraid. Maybe it's just one of those things that, that we admit. And, and can you relate right now to, to King David? Sometimes uh, danger and harm seem to be so far away, and yet other times it seems to be really, really close. And, and then just acknowledge, Lord, fear and trembling have beset me. Which leads to the final part. So what can I do with my, my fear. I mean, wouldn't it be great if in the midst of your fear, it could be, you know, your, your, your fear of uh, natural disaster, or harm or danger. It could be the fear of having the necessities of life. It, it, it could be the, um, the, the, the fear of the unknown. Wouldn't it be great if you had an angel that suddenly appeared and said, okay, Bob, don't be afraid. Susan, don't be afraid. Every time, wouldn't it be great if God showed up and said, hey, don't be afraid. Well, I really believe that God does show up. He shows up in his word. 
If, if I was to share with anyone the antidote to fear, I would say it's found within the pages of Scripture. For there God speaks, and over and over again, God says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Do not fear. So let me share with you four passages. What can you do when you're afraid? Number one, go to the Lord with your fears. Um, just surrender them to the Lord. Psalm 34, verse 4. It says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Isn't that great? Uh, David, a ma man after God's own heart, he had a lot of frightening situations. In this particular instance, there was a terrifying situation with the Philistine army. And, and he wrote these words. So you could ask him, hey, David, what would you do when you're afraid? And he would answer, well, I sought the Lord. And he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Just turn your face to the Lord. Uh, surrender your fear to him. Speak it audibly. Lord, I'm afraid. And, and do that within the pages of Scripture. And, and let him speak to you. The apostle uh, Paul, he, he was no stranger to, uh, to terrible situations. And I'm sure that he had some fears as well. Uh, here, here's what he says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Remember, he, he was in shipwrecks. Uh, he, he was in prison. He had some fears. And, and this is what he says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Um, he, he says... Present them to God. And, and, and within the pages of Scripture, the peace of God, it will guard your hearts. It will guide your minds in Christ Jesus. Number two, seek God's Spirit. Uh, sometimes I really believe uh, we minimize the power of God's Spirit. So, so we would readily admit that the, the Holy Spirit can change a person's heart and life, right? Right? can take a person who is stone cold dead in their trespasses and their sins and make them alive. Holy Spirit does that. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, uh, Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, so this isn't something that just happens to us once. The Holy Spirit, you know, redirects us. No, Paul says when you repent... When you are baptized, you are given as a gift the Holy Spirit. It, it reigns in you, this powerful spirit. And, and this powerful spirit, the Bible says, produces fruit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. You know, the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace. It's exactly what we need in the midst of, of, of our terror. Well, listen to this verse as well. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. So Paul is writing to a young man named Timothy who may have had some fears because he was young and suddenly he's a preacher. Uh, I can relate, 33 years ago. Uh, lots of fear, lots of anxiety. This is what Paul writes. For the spirit God gave us. Remember Peter said, the gift of the spirit is given to you. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So seek God's Spirit. Uh, actually, you, you can turn to the Lord, number one, to say, I'm afraid, O oh, Holy Spirit. I need you as I've never needed you before. Seek God's Spirit. Number three, focus on that which is good. Philippians 4, verse 8. Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So what do you do in the middle of the night? You're laying in bed and suddenly uh, fears uh, just overcome you about tomorrow, about an operation that's coming up. Um, think about such things. Think about that which is good. 
that which is noble, that which is trustworthy. It's, it's not just a thing. It's a person. Think about the, the Lord God Almighty. Just think about the, that scripture passage that you've memorized. Let the Lord bring it to your remembrance right there in your bed. You don't even have to get up. It, it, it could simply be, Lord, um, you are my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? Lord, you're the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I fear? Just recall the promises of God. Think about that which is good and that which is trustworthy. And then finally, number four, perfect love casts out fear. First John 4 verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love dries out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Um, folks, this is uh, uh, the love that God gives us and that is uh, clearly seen at the cross of Calvary. I really believe that John is addressing this fear, the fear of wondering, am I saved? The fear of wondering, does God really love me? Does he, he care about me? And that answer uh, is given once and for all at the cross of Calvary. Uh, he, he loves us. John is the one who said, for God uh, so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. John 3, 16. Same thing expressed in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. I really believe John is directing us to the cross when that fear arises. Have I done enough? Can I save myself? No. He, he has done it all. His grace is Sufficient. So John would write, there is no fear in that love. When you are loved in that way, when the grace of God so impacts your heart and your life, you're not afraid. Does God love me? Yes, he does. You're not afraid, have I done enough? Because you realize he's done enough. You're not afraid of where you're going to spend eternity because you know that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have the gift of everlasting life with him. So that perfect love casts out fear. So if I could simply summarize this lesson with one word, that one word would be the cross. When the angel came to the shepherds, do not be afraid. The, the, the shepherds were hearing good news about a Messiah coming. Not, not just to um, multiply bread and fish to make all kinds of fish sandwiches, not just to walk on water, not just to heal a leper or a blind man, but he came for the cross. Our fears um, are brought to the foot of the cross. And there we meet a God who says, this is how much I care for you. We bow our heads to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this time. And, and we just pray for all these uh, verses, Lord, that we've looked at uh, tonight. Some of them, Lord, um, they need to be in our hearts and minds even tonight when we sleep. Lord, uh, may your perfect love, may it cast out fear. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you next week.